Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor, and I'll be your host today. Um, so today, we are going to be looking at recommendations for what could be the next generation of poverty measurement. So earlier this year, the Interagency Technical Working Group on Evaluating Alternative Measures of Poverty, uh, which included members from a number of different agencies across the federal government, issued a report based on their work uh, looking at the options for the development of an additional alternative poverty measure. And uh, we're really fortunate to have the co-chair of that group uh, with us today. Um, so Bruce Meyer, uh, welcome. You're, you are the uh, McCormick Foundation Professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. And uh, again, uh, you were co-chaired this group in your capacity as a Census Bureau employee. Um, and Professor Meyer is also an IRP affiliate, I'm happy to note. So uh, Bruce, thanks for being here and for being willing to share Share this work to with us today. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, and our discussant today is David Johnson. Uh, David's our research professor at the Institute for Social Research and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Uh, and he's the director of the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, or PSID. Um, and he also worked for many years for the federal statistical system, uh, specifically looking a lot often at uh, linking administrative data. So I think uh, I think you're going to be um, have a lot of useful thoughts for us today. So, uh, David, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the uh, Federal Department of Health and Human Services for their support of this webinar series. That said, uh, any positions expressed in this webinar aren't necessarily those of ASPE or the Institute for Research on Poverty. Um, so as we get started, I want to give you a quick outline of our webinar today. Uh, we've got an hour. Um, and so uh, Bruce is going to take about the first half an hour or so. Um, and then we're going to follow up with uh, the discussion from David. And we'll save the final 15 minutes or so for your questions. So uh, with that, um, Bruce, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and I'm going to welcome you to share your slides, okay? Thank you, Dave. So the report that I'm going to describe um, is the work of over 25 people on the working group who were spread across 11 agencies. The uh, background research that I'm going to describe is the work of the Comprehensive Income Data Project staff and many co-authors. What I am going to say is not the views of the Census Bureau. So you might wonder why a University of Chicago professor is going to tell you about a federal committee that he co-chaired. Um, for three years, I was a part-time census employee uh, starting in February 2018. I had served on the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission. A fellow commissioner was Nancy Potok, who had been appointed as chief statistician of the US in the Obama administration. You might be thinking, I didn't know we had a chief statistician. And um, in fact, my brother who likes to tease when I told him about this position said, so why isn't it a statistician laureate or statistician general? Um, but there is a chief statistician and she's responsible um, for uh, coordinating these statistical agencies. Currently, the position is, is, un, is unfilled, um, I will say. So I went and I met with her um, in her office in the executive office building and suggested that we could measure poverty better and no good deed goes unpunished. A little later, I got asked to co-chair uh, this working group. And um, the way these federal working groups operate is that the recommendations that were made are likely to be implemented because they fall in a gray area between recommendations and decisions because the uh, statistical agencies involved are part of the group. And the report that I'm going to describe is a consensus re report that everyone uh, agreed to. So what is um, some of the background for the working group? Well, 
first, there's a lot of evidence that certain kinds of income are underreported in uh, surveys. Um, what this figure shows is the proportional understatement of four transfer programs in three surveys. This proportional understatement is just calculated as the total dollars reported in the survey divided by total uh, dollars that are paid out under the program minus one. Um, and we adjust for the intended coverage of the surveys. Uh, the CPS, which is the source of official income and poverty statistics is in pink here. American Community Survey is in gray. Um, so you can see that there's pretty sharp understatement of TANF, which is our main cash welfare program for single mothers, SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps, SSDI, which is disability insurance and UI unemployment insurance. There's also pretty dramatic underreporting of um, uh, pensions. Um, about 40 to 50% of pensions aren't reported in our main household surveys. Um, now, you might worry that when you compare what's reported in the survey to what was paid out, accounting for the survey weights, um, you might just be missing the poor in the survey, so that's why you might get a low number. But what this figure shows is that it's really um, misreporting that's the problem. This is showing you uh, in green the fraction of people who receive SNAP that are found in, in uh, the survey in, in the CPS and also in, in brown here for the ACS once you account for weighting. Um, so the main problem in surveys, uh, unlike polls, is not getting people where the problem is getting people to talk to you. The problem with surveys is getting them to take the time to give you complete and accurate answers. Um, so um, what um, uh, we find when we look at whether SNAP recipients show up in the right numbers in, in these surveys is that overall um, SNAP recipients, which are good proxy for the poor, um, in fact, when you look at uh, whether the average poor person is more deprived than the average SNAP recipient, it looks like um, SNAP does a better proxy of, uh, of measuring deprivation than um, official poverty. Um, so um, it's also true that accounting for the underreporting in surveys by bringing in administrative data matters a lot. Um, and so that's what this figure shows. What we do in this figure, um, it reports poverty rates in the current population survey, source of uh, official poverty numbers, and the SIP, which is thought to be the best survey for measuring income. And here we're using 2010 data uh, and reporting poverty using different income concepts. Um, when we account for uh, taxes, that's the um, second group of um, columns here. In the third group, we uh, account for in-kind transfers, not medical in-kind transfers, so SNAP, housing, school lunches, WIC. And in the final, um, columns, we account for the flow value of home ownership and uh, car equity. So the idea is that if you um, own a home outright, you um, don't pay rent and you essentially have the uh, rental value of um, living in the house. So we 
um, report poverty rates here for two income measures, one using survey data only, and a second with survey and administrative data combined, where we're replacing many of the mismeasured, under, typically underreported uh, types of income with administrative data when they're available. In some cases, when we have strong evidence that the administ administrative data are incomplete, particularly earnings and housing benefits. In fact, only earnings and housing benefits um, in what we're showing you here. We use some survey reports as well as the administrative data. The administrative data are still incomplete. We're still learning how to use them better. Um, and the gray columns here will go down quite a bit when we incorporate more of the administrative data that we currently are, are analyzing. Um, now, another message that comes out when you incorporate administrative data along with the survey data, given the underreporting of um, many transfer programs and some other sources of income in, in the surveys, is that the um, poverty reduction of many programs is quite a bit larger. So policymakers and researchers use poverty measures to assess the effects of programs and how well they're targeted. The poverty reduction of many programs is sharply understated by existing income poverty measures. When we look at how much higher poverty would be without various programs, we see much larger effects of many programs when we use combined survey and administrative data rather than the um, often mismeasured survey data. The survey numbers that I'm showing you uh, in maroon here that show much smaller poverty reductions are taken out of the annual SPM report, um, supplemental poverty measure report, um, the uh, survey and administrative data that I'm showing you are from the Comprehensive Income Dataset Project, or KID. Um, and for example, the combined data say that the um, poverty would be 25% higher if we eliminated SNAP, but if you just used the survey data alone, it would only say 11%. Another um, background um, pattern that led to this report is the finding that you could measure consumption well using uh, expenditure data and construct a poverty measure uh, that's based on consumption. And related to that is another motivation and theme in the report, and that's that the goal of poverty measurement is to identify those who are the most disadvantaged. That leads to a rigorous way of evaluating alternative measures by whether they identify a more disadvantaged population. Um, and what we find um, when we um, uh, uh, look at whether a consumption measure or an income measure gives you a more deprived population, does a better job of identifying the most disadvantaged, is that most indicators of disadvantage seem to suggest um, that consumption um, does a better job of capturing uh, low material well-being than, than income. And that's indicated by the plus signs in this table for different indicators of, um, of low well being. Um, so, um, besides evidence of underreporting uh, in surveys and improvement in the availability of administrative data um, and the uh, evidence that consumption poverty provides 
useful information on well being. Um, there were other reasons for the working group. It had been 25 years since the National Academy of Sciences Measuring Poverty Report that led to uh, the SPM, the Supplemental Poverty Measure. That report was an important advance at, it, at the time, and I can remember reading it 20 years ago and being impressed, but there are many places in the report where we know more now. And I can see the weaknesses as the profession has advanced and my understanding of the issues and the, the literature have developed. So I think it was time to rethink many of the issues in that report. Um, that report led to the supplemental poverty measure, which has many advantages, in particular, counting for taxes and in-kind transfers, but it has important drawbacks. The thresholds in particular are complicated and hard to understand. They have many arbitrary elements, but are nevertheless clothed in scientific language. The thresholds are ad hoc at times, the treatment of housing status or tenure assumes that there are no systematic differences between households that own outright, own with a mortgage or, or rent. Health insurance and medical costs are mostly ignored, but partially included in ways that could be counterproductive. Specifically, the SPM implicitly says someone who gains health insurance, but pays any positive cost is worse off than someone who doesn't have health insurance. Um, so what was the charter of the working group? Um, it was to consider whether alternative measures of poverty should be produced and what those would be. And the idea um, was that those would be alternatives that would supplement it, but not replace existing measures. The group was established by the chief statistician of the US, as I mentioned early on. Um, the members were subject matter experts from 11 agencies. There were no political appointees. I shared this group along with Kerry Leslie of the Statistical Policy Office of uh, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. We had um, 46 meetings of at least two hours over two years. Um, I will say it was a pretty grueling process. Um, we issued an interim report um, in early uh, last year. We got 20,000 comments, most of which were since this was at the start of the pandemic, could you give us more time? But we did get a lot of um, substantive comments as well. Um, and we, um, in the report, have uh, some text about where um, the issues that were um, mentioned in the comments and, and what we did is um, reported. Um, the final report was issued in early this year, um, just a couple of months ago. Um, you can find it on the BLS Bureau of Labor Statistics website or on the Census Bureau website. Um, and this is what the table of contents looks like. So let me tell you what we recommended. Um, and um, I did want to say uh, one thing. Uh, okay, it'll come up in a minute. Um, so a lot in the report about uh, process is there because there's some details that we didn't um, fill in, particularly about poverty thresholds. Um, poverty measurement has two key parts, the resource measure, usually income or consumption, and the thresholds. The thresholds are the cutoffs below which you are poor under a headcount poverty measure. Um, we recommended an income measure that combines survey and administrative data. 
and we recommended a consumption resource measure based on expenditures from the consumer expenditure survey that would incorporate the um, flow value of resources from owned houses and cars. The detail on the thresholds is um, uh, much uh, thinner. Um, we left a lot of that for future uh, decision. We can come up with a consensus on exactly what the thresholds should look like. Um, and we had some areas of uh, future research that we recommended. Um, so let me first talk about process. Um, at some junctures, we didn't think we had sufficient evidence or couldn't reach consensus on details. And we um, recommended that future uh, work um, Fill in, fill in the details and, and a future working group or a uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, panel. Um, but we felt we knew enough that a new measure based on existing knowledge would have sufficient merit to be published immediately as a research measure with um, uh, provisional thresholds um, with revisions and new methods added. Currently, um, we take about six months to uh, issue um, poverty numbers after the data are collected. And we um, expect that it will take a little bit longer than that, um, but not a lot longer to incorporate administrative data in the measure in a in a timely uh, fashion. Um, so in terms of income, um, we recommended that the current population survey be used because um, it is the survey that has a sufficient sample size uh, to calculate um, state poverty rates where um, data are currently pooled using three years of data to get state poverty rates. You could make an argument for using the survey of income and program participation based on data quality and the emphasis on income and program receipt measurement, but it's not big enough to calculate um, state rates. Um, we recommended um, accounting for taxes and incorporating in-kind benefits like the SPM does. Disposable income is closer to what generates well-being. You can't spend what's taxed away. And the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit are major anti-poverty efforts that we would want to account for. Um, in-kind benefits are also one of the main ways of reducing poverty. SNAP and housing benefits being some of our, our biggest anti-poverty programs. Um, we um, uh, recommended um, uh, using um, administrative data um, when possible um, to replace um, survey data when it was uh, supported by research that indicated that those administrative values were um, better than the survey values. Um, we recommended uh, research on why the survey and administrative values differ. And, and um, we um, recommended that regression-based modeling and administrative uh, be used when administrative data are not available, which is certainly going to be true um, early on for some of the state data that are not completely um, collected uh, by the Census Bureau, for example, SNAP data and uh, TANF data. Um, we also recommended strengthening data sharing across agencies that would facilitate this process. Um, 
on consumption, uh, we recommended using the consumer expenditure interview survey as the source of the data. It's really the only uh, choice. Um, we recommended additional funding to the BLS for this purpose. Uh, to produce a measure at the state level, you would need to increase the sample size when um, that uh, isn't um, implemented, we recommended producing um, estimates at the uh, census division level in the interim. Um, we uh, recommended using administrative data along with the expenditure data when appropriate. There's much less ability to do that with consumption data, but one example of when you can do that is uh, public and subsidized housing information since there is good information uh, from HUD on, on those benefits that can be linked to the consumer expenditure survey. For both um, income and consumption resource measures, we had a few uh, recommendations that applied to both. Um, in the case of health insurance, we recognize that it's a valuable in-kind benefit, whether provided by the government or an employer. We also um, recognize that you shouldn't be saying that someone who is sick and receives a lot of health care is well off. So we um, recommended that you value um, health insurance at its cost rather than um, the amount of uh, uh, benefits that you get directly from it in a, in a given year. Um, we recommended capping the value of health insurance at a share of the total resources, either income or consumption that you have, that recognizes that there's a lot of evidence that those with low income do not value Medicaid or other health insurance at cost. Um, we um, recommended that child support paid um, be subtracted from income because it acts like a tax, and that work expenses, including childcare, are a cost of generating income and should properly be subtracted um, from income or not included in, in consumption. Um, we also recommended including the flow of resources from car and home ownership, which is a form of income that goes back to the Hague Simons definition uh, of income, that's a classic way of defining income. It, more simply, if you own a house outright, you don't have to pay rent and you get a flow of resources from it. Uh, we took education to be mostly an investment, not current consumption. So it um, should not count as a resource and we um, did not recommend subtracting educational expenses from income uh, either. On the thresholds, um, they're um, inherently um, less scientific than the resource um, decisions. They're more, more heavily rely on moral and political judgments um, many have just called the exact level of the cutoffs arbitrary, including Molly Orshansky, who's taken to be um, one of the originators of our current measure, um, Pat Ruggles, um, Ivan Falegi, who was Canada's longtime chief statistician. All of them just at some point have said that the exact cutoffs are, are arbitrary. Um, and we largely left the threshold decision to others because we couldn't um, get uh, universal agreement on how to proceed. Um, now, speaking for as an individual, I hope we'll choose something 
simple and not try to justify it based on a budget for certain expenses. Um, we do talk about in the report how there's uh, a founding myth for our current thresholds that they were arrived at as three times a, a food budget, which it turns out was an after the fact justification for a political decision based on thresholds that Bob Lampman um, of Wisconsin and the Council of Economic Advisors had produced. And that was to arrive at Johnson's, President Johnson's 20% figure for poverty that he had been uh, saying on the stump. Um, so this is reported in um, Fisher's uh, retrospective paper on the, on the decision. And in fact, um, when the decision was made on thresholds, the, um, there were two budgets that um, were presented uh, to the administration and they chose the budget that got them the 20% figure that they wanted. So that's what was um, driving the decision of thresholds rather than some um, fundamental uh, understanding of what people need to um, get, get by or um, what was uh, the, the one budget that was obviously the right one. Um, and I will say that um, uh, Bert Weisbrod, also another Wisconsin person, independently came and recounted to me that it was really this political decision, not one based on food budgets that got us the, the, the thresholds. Um, um, so a second aspect of the thresholds that we um, didn't make a specific recommendation on is whether or not to adjust geographically. And um, this is a complicated issue. Uh, it might seem intuitively obvious that one should account for differences in prices across geography because there are stark differences in cost of living between rural Mississippi and New York City or San Francisco. But a, another theory of this is that what you um, pay for buys things besides four walls and, and windows and doors. Um, it buys the area that you're living with, which comes with a lot of public goods and other uh, resources. Um, and our decision to not make a recommendation on thresholds uh, geographically adjusted was in part based on uh, some research here that I'm gonna quickly show you that just looks at whether when you geographically adjust thresholds, you end up with a group defined as poor that's more or less deprived than if you don't geographically adjust. And what we find quite um, strongly, um, and this shows in, in pink um, estimates that uh, do not support um, a geographic adjustment to, when they're to the left um, and to the right when, when they do, um, the pink ones are not significant. The, um, gray ones um, are significant. You can see that um, a much larger number of the both significant and insignificant numbers suggest that you identify a more deprived group if you um, uh, do not geographically adjust poverty thresholds. Um, so let me... Um, uh, uh, finish up. Um, we also had some recommendations for future research. Uh, there was a lot of support for moving on to discuss multidimensional poverty measures, but that was more than this uh, group could take on in the 
46 meetings that we did have um, because uh, using many indicators for low well being is likely to do better than just looking at one or two. Um, we recognized that our standard surveys do not uh, cover the homeless and some other populations uh, well. Um, so there was uh, sympathy for um, doing more to uh, account for this group that's not uh, reflected in our poverty statistics. Um, the lags in poverty measurement are a problem. Um, we are um, already uh, oh, almost uh, a year from the depth of the pandemic um, in terms of employment, but we don't have any poverty measures officially um, for that period. We won't until September. Um, I've done some work with Jihoon Han and Jim Sullivan providing measures um, based on less data, um, but timely within, with a few weeks lag. Um, and there are other efforts that have been done to come up with timely measures of, of well-being that should be mentioned. Um, and the um, idea of bringing in administrative data to replace some elements of income that are asked on surveys also has the potential uh, to reduce the burden of surveys by allowing some questions to be uh, dropped from surveys. So um, these recommendations that the group made also will further the availability of administrative data for research in general and would lead to the collection of more expenditure data that would also have some collateral benefits. I will finally mention that the Comprehensive Income Dataset Project uh, that I've been working on is doing research to support these efforts. And there's effort, there's work going on at BLS and Census as well, um, supporting the implementation of these recommendations. So let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, thank you so much. I think you've given us a lot to kind of work with there and a lot for uh, David to respond to. So uh, so David, I'm gonna um, invite you to share your slides and uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to uh, kind of give us for feedback here. Thanks so much. And thanks again, Bruce. Thanks, Dave. And, and thanks to IRP for sponsoring this and thank Bruce for serving on this committee. I, first, I wanna thank uh, the committee uh, for their work, having been involved in developing and improving poverty measures for 25 years, I know how difficult, how fleeting consensus can be. Um, and I can see how many, many meetings, you could have consensus one meeting and then lose it the next meeting. And that, that seems to be the case on all of this. So I do wanna thank you. I'm gonna comment on, on some of the things about poverty, but there were 20, 36 recommendations in the report. So I don't think I'll have a time to comment about all of them and to comment about a couple of things that Bruce mentioned. But I first want to start um, by stressing, um, as this cartoon shows, that poverty is a very personal thing and it affects people. I think one of the things Bruce has show, shown and I think needs to be done more is to show the impact of the measurement on the well-being of people and how it changes that. I think that's critical for this. So I'd like to start with a challenge for all of you to think about what is poverty. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I want you to go home and think about it. Just think in your mind, a uh, conceptual thought experiment. Um, if you had to pick a, a line, a, a, a threshold for which people below that would be in poverty, what would that be? Um, and I'm going to predict that most of you are going to go home and think about, ah, people need some food, they need some shelter, they need some clothing, they might need a cell phone, they might need a car, and you're going to add that up, and you're going to then maybe come up with needs, or you're going to go to look at what people spend on that. 
Um, and then if I challenge you to do that, oh, what do you think poverty would look like 10 years from now? Uh, I'm gonna predict that what you would do is you do the same exercise. You know, standard living probably will have improved in 10 years, but the key is, does that mean poverty would have, would have fallen to these people? No, my guess is you're gonna say, oh, well, let's look at what people spend or let's look at what people need and add it up all again. And so that's what, that, that's what I think that the challenges are coming with poverty is how you do this. So what's nice about the report is it starts about coming up with a definition, right? So it says that the definition of poverty is what is minimally adequate standard of living defined appropriately for the United States today. So in other words, the, the, the measure has to be an indication of de deprivation as it is today. And again, that's one of the reasons why the official measure is so bad because the standard is based on a standard that was back in the 1960s, actually, some of the data from the 1950s. The report then begins by having their goal, right? So their, their goals were threefold, right? I, I'm a proponent that I don't really care about the level of poverty. It could be 20% or 10% or 80%. To me, there are three basic issues that the report focuses on. It's who they are, right? It's how does the poverty change over time? And the third is how do government transfers or economic factors change that poverty rate? So those are the three things that we need to be important when we look at the measure of poverty that the report focuses on. So it goes through these in turn. I want to put a plug in for the supplemental poverty measure because I think that's exactly what the supplemental poverty measure does. It looks at consistent resources and thresholds. It uses a better definition of a family. It allows the thresholds to change as changing standards of living. It accounts for all the government taxes and transfers. It does account for geographic differences in cost, attempts to deal with healthcare and housing, as Bruce mentioned. And I think it does better capture who is poor because it, it shows that the composition of poor is, has not been what we think it should be. And, and it's not clear that these things, there's more homeowners, more workers, more people with insurance and more married couples and inside MSAs. Some people might look at that and be counterintuitive, but in actuality, there are those people who are now struggling because the official measure doesn't measure their poverty correctly, I think SPM does. So first are the thresholds that Bruce talks about. And I think that report does a great job about not saying what the threshold should be, but raising the issue that the thresholds are key. So the supplemental poverty measure takes a basket of food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, plus a little more, maybe transportation on the threshold side and on the other side of the resources. And these are the resources that you can use to buy food, clothing, shelter, utilities. So it has to be consistent and balanced. And that's the report talks about how important this is in coming to the threshold. And so there are three things that don't allow that, like your health care, you can't use that to buy food, clothes, or children utilities, your, your work expenses, you can't use that, and your child care expenses. So the report agrees that child care and work expenses should not be included in the resources because you can't use it to meet the threshold. But you could move some of these other things to the threshold side, and then instead of using the actuals, you'd put group mean for these. You could do the same thing. You could move housing over to the resource side and using your net housing, so your rental equivalents, less your cost. Or you could put food and say, oh, it's your SNAP, less your food cost. And then your housing and your food would be actual, actual choices by the, by the people. And so depending on where you put this, it has to be consistent and balanced. And I think the report then says that the, the con consumption thresholds need to use this consistent and balanced approach as well. So you could say uh, that instead of using resources, you could use consumption on the resource side and just look at your total consumption compared to a threshold. I think that makes a, a lot of sense to use a consumption poverty that's basically using the SPM concept, but consumption on the resource side or income on the resource side. And consumption, I think is, is critical. I do think we need a consumption measure of poverty and the panel did back in 1995 recognize this. In fact, many people, I talked to Bob Michael and Angus Deaton on the panel said that they rather, they would have preferred, right? A consumption measure, but at the time they didn't think the consumer expenditure survey was a better measure. And this is where I really agree with Bruce. I do believe that the consumer expenditure survey um, 
has less measurement error of consumption at the low end than the CPS has, has of income at the low end. So that's the key. If it's better measured, then you should use it. Um, I'm going to skip that. Thing. But the key is, why do we want to use this? So it's not necessarily that the trends are different. So the trend in consumption, the trend in the supplemental measure are similar over time using a consistent method of adjusting the thresholds. But who is poor, as, as Bruce talked about, is not. So this is simple using the PSID. The PSID, the consumption is a little lower than actual consumption. So the, the consumption poverty is much higher than the SPM. But the key is, even though all those SPM people, the 11% poor, almost half of them, over half of them are not consumption poor, right? So th there are people who are consumption poor, but not income poor, income poor, not consumption poor. And this is what we really need to look at. And I think as Bruce highlights, and I think what needs to be done with this new data is to look at those people who are um, both consumption poor and income poor, and that'll give a better picture of them. After all, at the low end, like he says in the Hank Simon's definition, but at the low end, you would expect we know that basically income equals consumption plus savings, right? So the only difference between income and consumption was that savings. Well, that would then bring savings or wealth into the picture as well. And we get a threefold measure of, of poverty that I think needs to be looked at. Okay, a couple, couple points on Bruce's, specific points on Bruce's um, comments is on the administrative data. I think it's important to use administrative data. The key is how you do that because different researchers are coming out with different results. So this is his figure reproduced and you can see that the effect of cash and tax, the effects of tax and transfers and the, the last, last set of bars. Um, in the survey, poverty falls by 4.7 percentage points and in Bruce's measure, it falls by 5.2 percentage points. They're pretty similar. The big impact of using this administrative data is in those first two sets of bars changing pre-tax cash from 15% to 12%. And other work that census has done by John Rothbaum, he finds that that difference is a lot smaller. It's mainly only 0.6 percentage points. So the key is, I think we really do need to look at how we replace the data and how we use both. Then um, geographic adjustments. Um, I, I do think it makes sense that when you look at the poverty rate, um, the poverty threshold, the amount you need of food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, mainly shelter, is going to be less in the south than it's going to be in the coast. And hence, this is what the SPM shows. The poverty rate shifts from the south and the middle of the country to the coast because, the because of the housing cost. Now, whether that housing cost buys you other amenities, the key is, does it buy you things that help you buy food, clothing, shelter and utilities, it's not clear it does. For instance, if we looked at the food insecurity across the country, there's no doubt that food insecurity is higher in the South, but would that mean that, the, that changing, a poverty, changing a poverty method that shows less poverty in the South is gonna be better for food insecurity? I don't know. If you then looked at SNAP participation, SNAP participation is also higher in the South. That's not to say that, that SNAP causes food insecurity. I think we really need to look at the interactions. I think what Bruce's figure does here, the key thing it suggests is that we really, really need a reasonable set of measures of economic deprivation that we can compare uh, at the individual level. And that it's important to look at those. However, like you said, there's only 18 of these indicators out of 56 that are statistically significant the other way, and four in the direction that, that I think is, it shows that the geographic adjustments actually work. So they're really only 14 out of 56 that are, that are issues. So I think we really need to be careful of saying that um, 40 some odd out of 56 are showing that the geographic adjustments make people look um, better off than they are. But I do think it's important to compare those things. So finally, um, in my last minute, uh, I'll quickly go through some of the recommendations. So as Bruce said, the process, we definitely need new panels of CNSTAT to look at the SPM, SPM which we also already have. Um, 
and consumption. I think we do need a consumption measure um, that uses corrections for underreporting. Um, 12 month lag seems a little long for national research. I think we could release it with an adjustment. I think there is more research that needs to be done on the, on the, on the income measure, um, especially with the implementation method. So the key is, right, if you use admin data, you're not gonna be able to release a poverty measure for at least 12 months in my view. So I think using regressions, some other method would be good. And I agree that we need to have a consumption measure. The BLS definitely needs more funding, but we need as much research on the underreporting in the CE data. Maybe there's a CED, a CED coming up in Bruce's picture instead of in beyond the CID. For the for key of the, for both measures, I do believe that in poverty measure in health, housing, and education are some of the key issues that need to be more researched. But I do like it that the non-discretionary expenses like work and childcare are the ones that should be removed from both sets of resources, whichever you use. Um, healthcare obviously needs more, more input, but I don't understand really what a with and without value of healthcare, because the SPM, even though it subtracts healthcare from the resources, it still has it in there because any a lot of changes to the healthcare costs will have effect in poverty. Thresholds, I think the SPM thresholds make a lot of sense. I do agree we need research on equivalent scales. And what I really like to push is more research. So I do think we need to look at the, in, the only thing missing from the report is I think we do need a lot of look at the entire distribution, not just on the poor, but figuring out what this in, a good income measure is, a good consumption measure, and a good wealth measure, and look at the entire distribution uh, of those three measures and then focus again on measures of economic deprivation. Thanks. Okay, David, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to both of you just for um, a lot of really helpful information to cover. Uh, we have a number of questions, but um, one of the things that we've gotten a couple times in the uh, the question box is, is just kind of a little bit more of a foundational definition of like, what is consumption poverty? You know, I mean, I think a lot of us are very used to having an income measure and that, that sort of makes sense. That's what we're used to. Um, but for people that this idea of a consumption poverty measure, consumption based poverty measure is new for, how would you kind of uh, get Get us started there. So, Bruce, do you want to do you want to start us off, please? Um, sure. Um, so the idea is instead of looking at what people um, have in the way of income to buy food and housing and clothing, you look directly at what they are able to spend on food, housing, and clothing. The idea behind it isn't so much as conceptual, at least I don't think of the justification for doing it so much as, uh, as conceptual as that people are uncomfortable talking about their income. Um, it's, um, as one of my colleagues kind of uh, uh, um, uh, in a, um, I don't know how to put it, kind of a um, mischievous way um, in when discussing my work once reported that he looked in a survey and found people were much more willing to tell you about their sex lives than their income. And so um, the, the idea is that people are more willing to tell you about what they pay in rent and what they spend on food then they're willing to tell you about their income so you can more directly look at their standard of living in terms of what they um, are able to command in terms of goods and services. Okay. Uh, David, I've seen you nod for many of the things that Bruce said there, but I, I wanna give you an opportunity to add on there if you have anything else that you'd like to add that might help us here. So I wanna start with, even if the, the the adjusting with administrative data fixes the measure of income, I still think we need a good consumption measure. So I think they need both of them because I think it tells you um, more about people's command over their resources. It's just not, it's their actual standard of living with the consumption and their ability to pay with their income. And, and finding out what those differences are, I think is important. So I think we need both, even if we fix income. I want to add one thing that David said a while back in another discussion that we had years ago, 
that I think is very germane here. And that's that when you're thinking about looking at the elderly, um, income just isn't gonna do it because uh, income or the, the elderly are often spending out of their savings. And so current income really does not capture their standard of living or their well being. Okay, um, thanks for that for both of you. Uh, you know, we, we have a question, um, you know, Bruce, uh, towards the end of your talk, you, you said that, you know, survey data doesn't necessarily do a great job of picking up on, uh, for example, the homeless and certain other vulnerable populations, and that you're, you know, interested in finding ways to account for those folks a little bit more. So talk to us about that. What, uh, what, what, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, we didn't, we acknowledged the problem in our report, but didn't really lay out solutions. Um, what is true is that um, our main surveys that we use to measure poverty, the consumer, the current population survey and the survey of income and program participation are not designed to incorporate the homeless. So they're not, um, they're either completely ignored or, or sharply underrepresented in these surveys. Um, so um, we recommended that there be more attention um, to these populations by the statistical agencies. Uh, I can tell you that my research team has a big project um, trying to do a version of what we recommended in the um, report. And that's possible because there are additional data that the Census Bureau in particular has on homeless individuals, but they're not publicly released. Um, so with restricted data, um, either at the Census Bureau or research data centers, you can uh, examine the number of people in, in these dire circumstances and look at their uh, material well-being, their income and their program receipt. And we're also looking at mortality and uh, health measures. So um, that's what, that's an example of what we had in mind because this is uh, a group that's um, ignored in the official statistics and it's not even completely acknowledged that they're um, missing uh, in, in official reports. And so, um, I think that's something that needs more attention. David, did you want anything you wanted to add there? No. Okay. Um, you know, so we are. We are. I, I think we're gonna. We've take another five minutes or so. I know we're up against the hour, but um, but we do have a few more questions coming in. Uh, you know, one that I think is interesting goes back to this issue of measuring consumption, and uh, and her comment was that you know, um, with consumption, families spend their income very differently. And, and so less consumption doesn't always necessarily mean deprivation. And I mean, how do, how do we wrap our heads around that? You know, I think, I think that that is, seems to be the, the objection there, right? Um, is, uh, Bruce, do you want to start us off there? Well, um, I think that usually the version that, um, I hear is that, well, sometimes people overspend um, their income. And um, that version, um, the way that I think about it is that if you are looking at someone who um, in some period overspends their income, spends beyond their income, goes into debt, then you want to recognize that in that period when they're spending beyond their income, they're living in 
a nicer house, they're driving the nicer car, they're eating better. You want to recognize that. And then it may be that later when they have to pay back their debts, they're, um, they're skimping and not living very well. And you'd want to um, recognize that too by looking at their lower consumption in that period. And if you just looked at their income that say didn't capture that they were doing well when they were borrowing and doesn't capture that they were doing really quite poorly when they were paying back those debts, you would miss um, their well-being in both periods. Um, in, in truth, I think um, the biggest difference between income and consumption is really on this measurement side. It's what David said that um, there's less mismeasurement at the bottom with consumption than there is with income. Um, rather than um, people uh, uh, um, not, not uh, spending much in that, um, indicating that they're, they're maybe poor, but poor by choice in, in, in the example that I think the questioner was, was starting with. So David, you have any, you, yeah, just yep. point. this is why you need both. You need to do the cross tab. If, if the household is both income and consumption poor, you got something. If they're neither income or consumption, you got something. If they're on the off diagonals, I think there's, there's other things you need to look at uh, of what, what's, what's causing that. Are they overspending? If they have a lot of debt, that's a problem. Are they underspending at something else? Then that's a problem. But that's why you need both. In fact, I think you also need one on some type of wealth, something to look at those as well. Okay, um, so uh, so our, our second to last question here. Um, so I, I want to talk about thresholds. You know, we've talked about them being arbitrary, political. You know, like how do we how do we think about that? And I mean, I think you know, and and what is this? You know, as as you're kind of putting this together, you know, what what do you anticipate that this is going to look like? You know, um, that's the hardest question, and that's where I think uh, David and I probably differ the most. And um, I hope that we just come up with something simple that the Census Bureau and the BLS and um, we in the working group, we discussed a lot the possibility of having um, both relative and absolute thresholds. And I hope that that's um, what we do and come up with ones that are simple and easy to understand. I think that while it's intuitive that you should justify or you could justify thresholds by um, looking at a given bundle of goods that you think people should consume, there's an infinite number of ways to do that, which makes it in the end arbitrary and I think hard for people to understand why you should use one budget rather than another that they think is equally um, sensible. Can okay, I, David. Can I just say that I think we should use the term Irish judgment, not to make it arbitrary, because the, the 1995 panel, I was at the LS at the time, we produced, there must have been feet of computer printout of running every single combination and, and distribution of goods, right? F, FCSU, FCSU social welfare, FCSU post transportation, FCSU, every single, because that's what they were trying to do. They were really trying to understand the distribution of all these different types of bundles to pick them. So the, I think it was based on judgment. It wasn't necessarily, they just didn't throw them up and throw a dart. They actually looked at all these things to try to figure out what the best. I thought it was pretty clever. Um, to look at food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, um, plus a little more that could then change over time that would account for different things. Like the are gonna throw in the, you know, the internet services and housing now, so because that's changing. So I think that's part of how these thresholds will change over time.
Okay, so my final question, I want to give each of you a shot at this. In 30 seconds or so, what's our wrap-up thought here? Is there something that, you know, we haven't talked about in the Q&A that, that you want to mention? What are you looking for moving ahead? And, uh, and I'd actually like to start with David and then let Bruce wrap us up for the day. Um, yeah. I think measurement is critical. So the agencies need more money to, to, to look at this administrative data. They need the structure to share it across. All the agencies, I think all three agencies, BEA, BLS, and census should be involved in this. Um, BLS needs more for collection of the CE data. I think that's that's the key. And I think we need to look at this measurement. Okay, Bruce? I, I wanna emphasize that I think that this use of administrative data would greatly improve um, our ability to capture who's poor and who is, who's, deprived and that the exercise of bringing the administrative data uh, together for improved income measurement would have all kinds of collateral benefits in the statistical system and for research in general, because it would give you much better measures of income and program receipt and the effects of government programs. Okay. Bruce and David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this, putting these presentations together. And uh, I know that for me, uh, this clarified a number of things that, uh, you know, that, that you know, were, were less clear as I uh, read the report. Um, and I just really appreciate both of you taking the time to do this.